Well, we started uh, last week talking about uh, the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, last week um, we covered what the fruit was, and we know that everybody has fruit. If you're a born-again Christian, then you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. And um, that should be the thing that's most evident in all of our Christian lives. Now, you know, talking to a few ladies last night, there's some fruit that might not be as big or as bountiful as other fruit, but we still have all the fruit, right? Some fruit you might produce more in other areas or for other people than you do others, huh? If you have kids, say amen, because I know sometimes your patience, the fruit of patience for your kids, wears pretty thin, don't it? I got some parents going, yeah, just maybe just a little bit, just a little bit, huh? Yeah, but that, that, it's true. You know, there, there's some, certain things, but in all of our lives, we should see the evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, alive and well and working in us. That's, that, that, that's evidence that we know that we belong to Him. Amen? <laughs> Another one is that we can say that Jesus is Lord. How many of you can say Jesus is Lord this morning? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Jesus is Lord. Why can we say that? Because the Holy Spirit's alive inside of us. And without that, we couldn't say that. We couldn't admit to it. So this morning... You know, I, I told you we we're, were going to talk about different giftings of the Holy Spirit. And uh, some of the giftings, you know, a lot of people, they get kind of wishy-washy about. And, you know, when they bring it up, they kind of, you know, get uneasy, if you will. But there's really nothing to get uneasy about. If the Word of, the, if the Word of God in the Bible says that there's something in there, then there's something in there. If He says there's a gift that He's been given, let me tell you something, the gift is still giving. There's teaching out there today, and it's been going around a long time, that the gifts have ceased. The gifts have not ceased. And I'll tell you why the gifts have not ceased. is because, number one, we are still alive. We're not dead and we're not in heaven, right? And so until, uh, we, we, I showed you last week, until the perfect comes, then we will be walking in these gifts. Now, will they go away? Yes. The, the, the gifts will go away, but when, only when the perfect has come, all right? And um, Jesus did come to earth, but now he's at the right hand of the Father. And guess what? Guess who's coming back? The perfect one. And when he comes again, guess what? These gifts will fade away. They'll cease. They'll, they won't be around no more. Why? Because we won't need them. But as long as we're in, on the earth, we need these gifts. Why? Because he is still building his church. That's the purpose of the gift, is to build the church. And each and every one of us have different gifts for us to work together. So, in saying that, we're going to tackle head first the gift of tongues. Why? Because so many people, they, uh, they, they get so uh, weirded out by talking about the gifts of the tongues. You know, it's like one of those things, where, you know, I don't, I don't know about y'all, but when I was growing up, I was... About this tall, I wasn't very old, but I was in one of those. My grandmama took me to one of those um, charismatic Pentecostal churches, right? And um, Holy yes, Holy Rollers, pew jumping. You call it what you want to. That's what was going on. And uh, I was scared to death to ever invite a friend to church. I was. I was like, now you don't want to go to church with me. We are weird. <laughs> And, and so that's what, you know, so many times that's what we've been grown up with, and that's what we, we begin to think when, you know, certain things happen. But I want to show you something this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, I might not read all 25 verses, but I, I want to point out a few things. Now, it starts off with the very first sentence. It says, follow the way of love. Follow the way of love. Now, what's the one gift and the one fruit that we all have? There's one gift and one fruit that every single Christian has, and that's the gift in the fruit of love. If we're born-again believers, then you have the gift and you have uh, the fruit of love. And it says, follow the way of love. Why, why is it so important that the church um, have the, the fruit and the gift of love? Because not only is that how we're supposed to be, love is supposed to uh, be produced in us, but in building the church, we're, we're supposed to do it in love. And people should see the love coming through us. And so it says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire. What? Eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Now, has spiritual gifts been a desire of your heart? 
If you haven't been eagerly desiring spiritual gifts, and I, I, I think that you might have just gotten a little bit comfortable in where you're at and what you're doing. Gifts are to build the church, and um, you need to pursue, you need to eagerly desire the gifts that God has for you. I remember when I was a kid, on Christmas time, I would eagerly desire the gift that was under the, pre- under the tree, right? And sometimes I'd go ahead and get an early start, huh? Yeah. I mean, I want to get an early start on some of these gifts. It says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, we'll be covering prophecy next week. Why? Because that's another one of those things that so many people, when they say, hey, you know, what's a word of prophecy? You know, they're like, man, that's, that's a bunch of weird stuff. I don't want to have anything to do with it. It's in the Bible. If you say you don't want to have anything to do with the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy, you might as well say, I don't want to have anything to do with the Bible, right? It's true. It's in the Bible. So we've got to study it and we've got to understand it. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to, to men but to God. So you need to underline that first part because we'll be talking about that. The gift of tongues. If anyone, spe- or if anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Do you know that you're spirit beings? Well, you are. You might have a physical body, but you know what's going to die? Your physical body. You know what's going to live forever? Your spirit. I heard a song the other day that I think fits this right. It says, hey, this world that we're living in is really a dream state. Because when we die, this is not where we stay. Amen? Our spirit's going to leave our bodies and it's going to be united with God in heaven. Amen? Where did I leave off? Anyone? Okay, verse 3. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening. Now, we'll get to this next week, but here we go. Strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. All right? That's another thing you need to understand. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like for everyone of you to speak in tongues. And this is Paul saying this. I want all of you to speak in tongues. Now, is, is all mean all right there? Does that mean the entire church? Does he, do we, does he want all of us to do it? I believe all means all. If you go back and look that word up, all, it means all. The entire church. He says, I wish all of you would. Why? Because there's benefits, and we'll show, I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. He says, I wish all of you would speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Okay? Now, I'm going to stop right there. And if you want to, you can go ahead and read the other verses yourself. But I want to answer one question for you. And that question is, what is exactly speaking in tongues? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Raise your hand if you have. Anybody? Okay, there's a few of you that have. Maybe some of the other ones don't know. But what is speaking in tongues? Speaking in tongues is simply, simply put as this. Now, Dwayne, if you're watching, I'm making it as simple as I can, okay? Just right there for you. Simply put, you're speaking in a language you have never heard before, that you don't know. And it's brought on to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? You're speaking in an unknown language you've never heard it, now, if you want to, uh, flip over, this ain't in your notes, but you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. It, it, it's, it's very simple about what these types of tongues are. Are there are, are they human tongues? Do, does the Holy Spirit empower us to, to speak in a tongue that, that is in human form? Absolutely. Now, but it also can be this, and it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... Some of the stuff, you know, when you're speaking in tongues, it, it just don't make sense. Why? Because it's not an earthly language. It says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm just a resounding gong. All right, so it does you no good to have the gift of tongues and use it without love, right? Matter of fact, I think love is the precursor to it. You need to, if it's really going to be effective, it has to be grounded on love. Now, so you're speaking in a tongue, a language that you've never learned, you've never heard, by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to really understand that. Who gives us the gifts? Who gives us the gifts? The Holy Spirit does. 
We saw that last week. He gives the gifts as he sees fit. Okay? Now, now I can get to my first point this morning. Uh, four purposes of speaking in tongues. There's four things I want to cover about speaking in tongues so that we can all have a good understanding of what it is and not be so weirded out if it happens. And not, uh, also that we may eagerly desire this gift that God wants to give us. And uh, if the Holy Spirit starts putting it on you, that you go ahead and you step out in faith and you walk in it because it's not weird, okay? It's you being walking in obedience to God and taking the gift that He that he has for you. Okay, the first one is this. It says, now I put one in parentheses right there because it's only one evidence of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's only one of the evidences of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about the, like, um, when you, uh, when God gave you the faith to believe in Him and the Holy Spirit, you had the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, I'll, you, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And if you read more and more into what that really means, all right, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get this power. The Holy Spirit empowers you to do something. He empowers you to be a witness. He empowers you to be a witness. Now, many times, and if, especially if you go back and you, you look in Acts, and you, you start studying the book of Acts, you'll see a common theme there. That when believers were, were baptized with the Holy Spirit, when they got the, when they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, many of them began to speak in tongues. And so that was just one evidence of you being baptized in the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. But it's not the only evidence there is. The true evidence of you being baptized in the Holy Spirit is, number one, you receive power, and number two, you got the gifts of the Spirit alive, or the fruit of the Spirit alive in you. All right? That's how you know if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's a whole, whole other lesson that we, we need to talk about in, in other sermons. So you can be baptized without ever speaking in tongues. You could, you could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without ever speaking in tongues. Now, that goes contrary to what some people believe. They don't believe that you can even be saved unless you speak in tongues. That's not, that, that's not true. That is simply not true. And, you know, if it was true, then it would be a condition, right? It would be a condition that we'd have to meet in order to gain salvation. But it's not. It's a gift that God has bestowed on us. So Acts 1.8 says this, and it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And to the ends of the earth. Now, what were the apostles doing? All right, they was up in this room, right? They were sitting there, and they was waiting. Why? Because Jesus said, Hey, guys, I want you to go to the upper room. I want you to sit and wait until the Holy Spirit comes. And it said when he came in, it was the sound of rushing wind, and the tongues of fire broke out among them. Okay? And everybody started speaking in, in other tongues, and the people that were outside of it, they was like, man, what is going on up there? These guys aren't even our, you know, from our culture, but I hear them speaking in my own language. And then they started doing what? Glorifying God. Hey, speaking in tongues, you know, part of it isn't to bring you glory. Right? It, it brings people to glorify God. All right? Look at uh, Acts 2, 1 through 4. And it says, When the day of Pentecost came, this is a separate time, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like blowing or a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And verse 4 says, And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Who enabled it? The Spirit. It's Spirit-led. It's Spirit-gifted. It's not something that you can just kind of muster up on your own. I, well, I guess you could. You know, I guess you could start saying a whole bunch of stuff, but it, it doesn't profit you any. If you just try to do it, you need to let the Holy Spirit enable you to do it. Let Him give you the gift. Um, on and on, Acts 10, uh, 40, 43 through 46, it talks about other times where um, the Holy Spirit fell on people and, and they were baptized in the Spirit. Acts 19, 1 through 6. I don't think I'm meant to put all of them on there, but 
I, I want you to have them in your notes. Why? Because it, it's one thing for me to, to tell you about them. It's another thing for you to pick up your Bibles during the week and read about it yourself, right? That's where the, really the rubber hits the road, huh? When you said, hey, um, I'm going to pick up my Bible and, and read it on my own and make sure Shannon ain't just filling me full of a bunch of bull, right? Do any of you take those notes home anyway? Yes. Do, you, do you look at them? Do you study them at all? Are you, some of you kids make airplanes out of them. I know I see them in the seats. <laughs> right? Does you no good, Bergen? I just called you out because you're my daughter. <laughs> but on and on and going, it talks about how when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit, you begin to speak in other tongues. And we'll come back to these two verses um, in uh, Acts 10 in just a moment. But let's go on to the next verse, the next point. The number two purpose for tongues is for personal prayer and edification. Personal prayer and edification. Now, that word edify, it means to build up. It's for your personal prayer and to build you up. Um, 1 Corinthians 14 2 through 4, it says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Okay? You're speaking, it's a it's a it's a one-on-one deal. It's you and God in this setting. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men and there's for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He edifies himself. Now, once again, that word edify means to build up. Edifies himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church or edifies the church. Now, flip up, or if you're, you might be on the same page, but 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15 says this. It says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. It's not you, it's your spirit. But my mind is unfruitful. Right? Your mind, my, my, it, it has no idea what you're saying. It can't understand it. It says your mind is unfruitful. Verse 15, it says then, So, what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. See, Paul here, he, he's not dodging the bullet of, of when the spirit takes control and starts to pray through you, Okay? He, he, he's saying it's good. Not only should you pray in the Spirit and sing in the Spirit, but you should also pray with understanding, with words. Amen? Verse 18 says this. It says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, we know that Paul went around doing a lot of teaching, right? He did. He went around he taught a lot of people. However, I think in his personal prayer time, he, pray, he, he spent a lot, of, a lot of time praying in tongues. Why? Because in other verses, he said, I'd rather speak five words that people could understand than 10,000 words in a tongue that no one understands. Matter of fact, it's just a little bit above that where he, he says that. Now, look at Romans 8, 26 through 27. And it says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Or that's Ephesians, I'm sorry. Romans 8, 26. And it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do, not know what to, we do not know what we ought to pray pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Now, verse 27. And it says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So there's two things I want to point out in those two passages right there. There's going to be times, in, have you ever been in a situation where you had run out of words to pray and you did not know what else to pray? But the situation was still there, it was still at hand, it was still pressing down, and you were just without words. It's then when the, the Holy Spirit will start praying through you. And, and it says with groans that cannot be uttered. 
Have you ever been so burdened that all you could do is moan or, or groan for somebody in prayer? Other times when you don't know what to pray, it says he searches, the, the Spirit himself searches out. In that last verse, in accordance with God's will, the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now, we could be praying for somebody, and you've prayed everything that you know how to pray, and all of a sudden, you know what? You, you start praying in tongues. Why? Because the Spirit is interceding in accordance with God's will. It's very important that you understand that this not only helps you, but it could also be a way of interceding for somebody else. Now, I don't think, but maybe just a few people here has, have ever heard me pray in tongues. Um, Cindy and Jill, and I think that was about it. But it was, for, it was for Rhonda. It was vacation Bible school. And we, Rhonda had gotten sick again. They was taking her to Wichita Falls. And we, we huddled up and we began to pray. And we prayed and I was like, man, I, I, I prayed and I prayed. I don't know what else to pray. I have no other, I don't know, I don't know what else to do. And so then the Holy Spirit took over and I, I began to pray, pray in tongues. And uh, I believe it was in accordance with God's will. I'm not saying my prayer made her get up and walk, but she didn't die from that stroke. Amen? But it, I'm not saying it was only my prayer, but I, I believe the Holy Spirit was working uh, through me and through a whole lot of other people on behalf of Rhonda. And if he did it for her, can he not do it for you? If he did it for her cir circumstance, will he not do it for you? Absolutely he will. He definitely will, but you just got to trust him. And you got to yield to him when he, when he starts uh, moving you to do that. Ephesians 6, 18, it says this. Now here he is. Paul is telling us these things. In Ephesians 6, flip over there if you will. You need to underline this stuff so you can go back and, and read it. And it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. When are you supposed to pray in the Spirit? On all occasions. Every single one. Why? Because you don't know, or more than likely, you might think you know what God's will is for the situation, but you probably don't. Why? Because you don't know the mind of God. Do you? How many of you in here are smart, uh, as smart as God? How many of you can tell the future like God can? Does anybody know what the future holds? If you are, you're a fortune teller and you need to get on down the road. Or you need to get delivered, one of the two. But God knows the future. He knows the future. We don't. So some of the things that we pray for, we're praying because uh, we're, we're emotionally attached to the situation, right? There, there, there's something that maybe we desire out of it, but when we let the Spirit praise, He prays in accordance to God's will. And we know that this, when we pray anything according to the will of God, we know what? He hears us, right? That's what the Bible says, right? And John, he says, if, if you pray in a, with the will of God, then you can be assured that He hears us. Amen? I don't know about you, but I think we need to spend some more time praying in the Spirit so we can pray the will of God. With all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Who are we, who's the group we're supposed to be praying for? All the saints. Who's a saint? That's right. Believers. We need to be praying for them. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of believers in the world right now that are going uh, through intense persecution that we have no idea about. Probably even right now, there's probably some of them that are getting beaten. They've probably gone without food and without water. They might even be naked and unclothed and freezing. And we have no idea about it. But we need to be praying for, for those Christians that are being treated that way. Because they are being that, treated that way in other parts of the world. They don't have it as good as we do here in America. All they have is Jesus. Look at all we have. We've got, we got lights, got electricity. We can have heat. There's some places you can't do that. In some places, it's illegal, like in North Korea, to speak the name of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, there's a... a, a a missionary from Australia that has been um, 
taken captive by the North Koreans. And he's 75 years old on the mission field. Say what? I thought when you got 60-something, you could retire. What is the age, Larry? I don't know. No, no, no. Okay, I won't ask you. Right? 75 years old, he goes over to North Korea, and he has his Bible in the hand, and they, they confiscate him and his Bible and throw him into prison. Now, what's a 75-year-old man? Is he really going to whip somebody over there? No. But he's walking in love, and he's walking in obedience. He's not over there to try to, to harm people. He's, trying to, he, he's going over there to help people to teach him about Jesus Christ. Because he believes there's some lost people in North Korea that need to know about Jesus Christ. So if you believe that, then you need to be praying for that man and thanking God he didn't send you over there to, to, to suffer like he's suffering. Just saying. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I heard a testimony recently, and basically exactly what Shannon was talking about, and, and it really helped me understand why we pray in tongues. One of the main reasons, but this um, this rabbi came to visit a Christian church, and as they were touring the church with the pastor, the um, they went by the prayer room, and there was a man inside there praying in the spirit, and he was the, he caught the rabbi's attention. He said, "Who in there knows high Hebrew?" And he says. He says, oh, that's just brother, I think his name was Bob or Bill. He said, I think he's just in there praying and um, interceding. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I know what he's doing. And he said, well, what is he doing? He said, he's calling. Um, he said, because they stood and listened for a while. He said, he's calling um, angels by name to go to countries. And um, he's assigning them to, to um, missionaries that he is saying. He's calling them by their names to go forth and do the work of, of the Lord. And he said, and he, he was actually able to um, interpret all of it because the rabbi knew Hebrew. And the man didn't that was praying. He was just praying in tongues. And we think that we're, we're praying for the saints. We're praying for the saints. Yeah. We, we, don't, we may not even have any idea what the Lord has he's called us to do, but... That helped me really understand the urgency of it, just in what you're saying. I mean, that's a good testimony. And uh, one other verse I want to give to you is Jude uh, 20. It says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in this Holy Spirit. And pray in the Holy Spirit. We can translate that into this. It says, but you, dear friends, edify yourselves in your most holy faith. That's our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And pray in the Holy Spirit. In this private prayer, when we allow ourselves to be used by God and to pray in tongues, there is no telling, like what Heather just shared, what our prayers are actually doing. But we can be assured of this one thing. When we're allowing the Spirit to, to use us and he, he, he gives us this gift of tongues and, and, and we're praying it, we can be assured of this one thing, that the will of God is being accomplished. Our Scripture would tell us something different. Amen? Eagerly desire that. Eagerly desire it. Eagerly desire it. Now, the third part of tongues is for uh, corporate, uh, a corporate word or corporate worship. All right, First uh, Corinthians fourteen five, and it, uh, it says this. <clears throat> it says, "I would like for all of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified." So, now. And there's an order that Paul gives a little bit later on down about how uh, tongues in church should be uh, accomplished. All right, if anyone has a, a gift of tongues and they and we're in the corporate body, right, and we're worshiping God together, and they and the Holy Spirit falls on them, and they get empowered by the Holy Spirit to give a, a gift of tongues. Then there has to be an interpretation of that tongues. Why? Because you're not edifying yourself anymore. Who are you building up? 
the church. It's to edify and to build up the church. It's a word of God that's going to edify and build up the church. All right? Now, let's go to um, uh, 14, 26 through 28. It says, What shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn. Now, let me just clear up something. What is a hymn? It's a song, okay? It's not the book, right? The orange book that you see in front of you, huh? That's a hymnal, and it has a bunch of songs in it that you sing, but a hymn is a song, okay? Or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of this must be done for the strengthening of the, the verse, uh, there we go, of, of the church. Why couldn't they put that one word right on the other sentence? Verse 27. It says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or three at the most should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. All right? If anyone speaks in a tongue, verse 28, please. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Now, this is where, when I was growing up, my grandmama's church was all out of whack. Because it wasn't two or three. It was the whole church. And they were all going about it, and they were all doing it, and it was completely out of order. And what, what happens then? When you go in there and you see a bunch of that stuff going on, you're going, uh-uh. I ain't going in there. They're, they are weird. Right? And I was brought up, right? And I, I thought it was weird. But, there's an order that must be followed out. He gives us an order on how it's to be done in church. If someone has a, a message in tongues, then there needs to be an interpretation. Either the Holy Spirit will allow you to interpret it yourself, and you'll build up the church, or he'll, he'll follow the, the Holy Spirit will follow somebody else, and they'll in, interpret the tongue for the body that will build up the church. That's the biblical practice of tongues in church. Now, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 says this. <clears throat> oh, I think I should have started with that one first. I'm sorry, Danny. Uh, I got jumped around there. But uh, to one there is, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. And the reason I put this in there, to another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And the last one is to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still others the interpretation of tongues. Now, I should have made that one first, but I went ahead and read it too. But you, you, you see that the Holy Spirit gives it out, especially in church, right? He'll fall on somebody, and, and, and it's to build up the church. Amen? You see that? You follow me? Have I lost you? Are you getting some understanding of what tongues are? Are you, are you not weirded out by it anymore? You shouldn't be. All right? It's a beautiful thing that God has for us. Now, the, the fourth and the last thing is this. It's a sign for unbelievers. It's a sign for unbelievers. Now, this verse in 1 Corinthians 14.22 and that passage of where it's talking kind of tripped me up a little bit. right? Because I'm like, man, this is kind of backwards. I don't understand what you're saying. And it says this, it says, Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. Now, okay, I, I kind of understood that. But then this is where I, I was like, I don't understand until I, I was showed something. And it says, So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Well, I thought you just said the tongues was for the unbeliever. Well, it is. And I'll show you what he's really talking about right there. But if the unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he, he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now, it said he would do that when he heard prophecy, the unbeliever. But if he heard tongues, he's like, you're all weird. All right? it's, it's, and so, you know, I kind of got tripped up there until I, I, I really figured out what this verse is talking about. 
And here it is. Back in Acts chapter 10, verses 43 through 46. During this time, the, the Christians, you know, they were Jewish, right? And they, they believed in Jesus. But some of them thought that nobody could come to know Jesus unless first they, they come into uh, Judaism and by putting on these mosaic rites. And the circumcision was, was one of the big ones, right? And so they, they didn't think anybody else could receive Jesus Christ until they had first been Jews, right? So in Acts 10, 43, here, here it goes. This is where I, I started getting some stuff clear. And it says, All the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, these words the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. For they had, oh, <laughs> that's not even Tyler back there. <laughs> the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. All right, these were the Jews, right? They had received Jesus Christ and the, the Holy Spirit. They were astonished. Why? Because they didn't, they didn't know that all this Gentile bunch could come in without first being uh, Jews. They were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. All right, so there was a, a, a barrier there. All right, there was a racial uh, difference. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then it goes on to say, how, Peter says, how, how can we deny these people? They have received the same Holy Spirit that we have. So now for the unbelieving people that are in church that are Christians, they don't think somebody can get saved, right? They're like, oh, no, he's too far gone. All right, there is no way he's turning. There is no way he can be saved. God will not save him. And all of a sudden, they get saved, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. They begin to speak in tongues. And now that unbeliever of a Christian that couldn't believe this guy could be saved has now just witnessed that he could be saved. But it's also, now that's one part of it. The, the other part for the unbeliever falls back in Acts chapter um, 1 and, ver and chapter 2. Because the multitude were gathered around, right? And when the Holy Spirit fell on them, go, go ahead and go to Acts chapter... Um, th yeah, that, that's fine right there. If you want to, go ahead and flip over in Acts 1.8. You need to see it yourself. All right, one eight it says, "But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll and, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth." After he said this, the, or Jesus was taken up before their eyes in a cloud from their sight. Now, all right, now we can skip down to verse uh, or chapter two, verse one. It says, "And the day of Pentecost came, and they were gathered in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing or a violent wind came." From heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were some staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, right? When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking. In his own language. In his own language. And that goes back to how, what Heather just testified about the rabbi priest. How he heard him in his own, langu uh, own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And that surprised them. Why? Because they were from different places. But yet God supernaturally enabled people to speak his mysteries and his will so that the unbelievers outside could hear the message of Christ or the message of God and they came, they came in. So, yes, it's, it's for the unbelievers that don't know, but it's also for some of us believers that don't think other people can be saved because they can. 
No, like Heather, she shared a testimony. I'll, I'll close with this. There was a, oh, I think it was Kansas. I don't want to be wrong on the state, but I, I believe it was Kansas. There were, the church was coming together, and uh, they, they were worshiping. And this little girl, she was about 10 or 11. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell on her, and she began to speak in tongues. And someone was about to call her down. But no one saw the, the Indian that walked in in the back. There, there was a, I think he was Apache. And he, he was sitting in the back. And that message that she gave was strictly for him. Because there was no way that she knew that native tongue. And yet she was speaking directly to that man. And after she finished, that guy got up and he walked down to the aisle and they hadn't even started preaching yet. you believe that? The preacher hadn't even gave an altar call. And he grabbed the preacher and said, look, I need to repent of my sins and I need to be saved. That girl just told me about Jesus Christ. Now, if that's not the power of God, I don't know what is. I'm telling you what, we need to get some foreigners in here, right? From all over the place, all right? But that's one part of it, guys. There, there's these four things there that you don't have to be weirded out about praying in, in tongues or speaking in tongues any longer. You, you can see that it, it is a God thing. It is for the edifying of yourself and also the building up of the church. It's to go out and get the unbelievers, right? And it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. So let's not quench the Holy Spirit. If He wants to give you the gift, receive it. And just let him go. Don't try to hinder him. Just take it. Amen. All right. So how how are we now with the gift of tongues? Because we we have a really a really diverse group of people here. All right. And I, I think some of us may not have ever heard about tongues or think that it was long gone. But I'm trying to make it as clear as I can that it's not weird, that it's not gone away. That it's powerful and it's it's God driven. It prays the will of God and it's for the body of Christ. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you today, Lord, for God just once again just doing a, a mighty work in us.